Hello everybody, Neon here from Artifact Academy. I wanted to do a video today talking about the article that dropped on the website today talking about uh, gaming according to Garfield or Dr. Garfield's approach to uh, game design and game theory. So uh, there's an article of course linked in the, the description if you want to go through that and see all the, the details in there, um, go for it. But I wanted to give a you know, summary of this in the video format for those who are interested in that. So as everybody here should know Richard Garfield is one of the lead designers on Artifact which is really exciting since he's the father of the trading card game he's the creator of magic and he's been involved in creating a lot of other trading card games or card game uh, or games in general over the last 25 years so it was really exciting to hear that he was going to be part of the project but when I heard this I started to think it's like hmm I don't really know what Dr. Garfield's thinking is about game design, like what's his philosophy on, on the subject. I know that he had written a lot and spoken a lot uh, on the subject over the course of this time, but I thought it would be useful to study this and then communicate something to the, the community because I thought it was a really interesting subject. So before we get into that, I actually want to spend a little bit of time talking about why is it important to study you know, game design, why game design you know, matters as gamers. Because I don't think this is true of most different types of media appreciation. So if you're a moviegoer or you know, audio listener, if you, if you like music, you like books, I don't think it's really necessary for you to enjoy film theory or know anything about music theory or literary theory in order to get a lot out of your genre of choice. One of the you know, great things about um, great works of, um, of media uh, is that you, you know, great works of art is that you don't really need to know why you enjoy them in order to enjoy them. You just do. Um, things change a little bit for, for gamers. Obviously, you can still enjoy games without knowing a lot about game theory. There's like, tons of people, and the average gamer still doesn't know anything about it. But the one of the things changes is that if you're trying to win, if you're trying to maximize your chances of you know, progressing, I actually think it's quite useful to understand the rules, mechanics, and um, theory behind why the game works the way that it does. Uh, now, once again, this really only applies to people who are trying to be competitive. If you're casual and just kind of want to you know, mess around and have fun, you know, go go have at it. Just you know, uh, do what you like. Your know, gaming is is there to enjoy, and, um, and and there's nothing wrong with with that. But if you're really trying to you know, maximize your chances of win, it's I think that it's quite useful to understand sort of how games work more fundamentally. And this is particularly true of card games. One of the things that's an interesting facet of card games is that it, when you're talking about deck design, uh, it's sort of asking you to think like a game designer in some capacities. So there's um, there's actually a whole kind of complex reasons as to why the uh, history of game uh, design and history of card game theory has, has involved a lot of overlap with thinking about game design. I'm not going to get into that here, but I just think that the genre itself is particularly well designed in order to encourage you to think in this way. With that, let's uh, do a few disclaimers before getting into the meat of the subject. So, first off, I want to make totally clear that this is not an official summary in any capacity. This hasn't been authorized by Dr. Garfield. I haven't had direct contact with Dr. Garfield, so don't take anything as I say as some sort of gospel. Uh, also, this is a, a, just a summary. Um, Dr. Garfield has been thinking and talking and writing about gaming for almost 30 years now, and I'm not going to be able to capture everything in that in uh, a video like this or in an article like the one that I wrote. Also, I'm going to be focusing on generalities here. There's going to be exceptions to a lot of the rules that I'm talking about. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of great games out there that break, you know, quote unquote, some of the rules of conventional game design. So if I get people who are you know, in the comments talking about it, it's like, oh, you know, this game doesn't follow that rule. Yours, they're totally wrong. I'm just going to respond with trick remotes like you know, Failfish and Swift Rage or something like that. I haven't decided, though. Could be, could be some other ones. But anyway, uh, I also want to stress that um, most of this just applies to ortho games this is a term that dr garfield uses in a lot of his writing and it's a game that's between two or more people with defined winners and losers and with a defined endpoint. this is you know opposed to games like cooperative games where everybody's sort of working together or games which don't have a fixed endpoint, like dungeons and dragons or world of warcraft etc a lot of so some of the stuff doesn't apply there but you'll, you'll find that some of it also still applies to those kinds of games as well 
Next, um, the topics are going to be fully separated. There's going to be a little bit of overlap here and there, um, as you can expect with any complex topic like this. And then I'm also not going to be prefacing everything with Dr. Garfield things, where I think the Dr. Garfield things, this kind of gets obnoxious. Um, I'm going to do my best to make clear when I am putting in my own thoughts or my own uh, predictions based on on things. I'm going to be talking a lot through this about how does this apply to artifact and we, what might we expect to see in artifact. Is it? Like, those are all my own thoughts. For, for most of the, the things that I'm not saying that, I'm actually just going to be trying to give a summary of what I think Dr. Garfield thinks. And just there's a lot of links that I've, I've used, a lot of sources that I've used. They're all linked below. There's a you know, whole lack of links down there, some interesting uh, related material as well. And of course, a link to the original article. So you can check that out uh, as well. But let's move into things. What does Dr. Garfield think about game design? And we're going to start with balance, collapse, and rock, paper, scissors. So balance is a topic that everybody, of course, has been exposed to when thinking about uh, games. You you want to have a variety of strategies that are uh, equally viable or similarly viable so that they're in balance with, with one another. Now, this is challenging actually to do in, in practicality because it's pretty easy to have one strategy be overpowered relative to another one and then pushes out other strategies from the environment and ultimately you're left with a, a world in which there's although there were apparently a bunch of different strategies only one of them is actually viable because it's just the best one and this is what's known as strategic collapse which is a, uh, a situation that you want to avoid in in your games one of the easiest ways to avoid this is actually to use some version of rock, paper, scissors balancing. So everybody, of course, knows the simple game where one thing beats another thing and that, you know, they're all linked together in a circle. There's not one that's strictly better than the others. Um, and, you know, although this isn't usually applied in such a cut and dry way in conventional games, you can see that it's um, that there are a lot of games that use elements of a rock, paper, scissors balancing system. So in uh, card games, you'll see that aggro decks are often beaten by mid-range decks, but then those mid-range decks can be beaten by control decks, and those control decks are beaten by the aggro decks. And that's a sort of a truism that um, a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, and also you, you, in RTS-style games, you'll see uh, melee units, uh, will be weak to flying units, which will be weak to range units, and those range units will be weak to the, the melee units. This is all different styles of rock, paper, scissors balancing. This means that n none of these strategies, none of these units are going to be strictly better or dominant over any of the others because there's always going to be a natural counter to them in practice. <gasps> Wait a minute, Dion. Uh, isn't Rock, Paper, Scissors just like a terrible game? Isn't it just a game of chance? Why would we want our competitive games to be styled after Rock, Paper, Scissors? That's a pretty natural response, but I think it's a little bit short-sighted. So, for instance, it's not necessary that all of the matchups has to be you know, strictly better than like you know like scissors always beats paper but there's no reason that that has to be the case for our games when we're using rock paper scissors style balancing so let's take a look at some example meta games that we could see in artifact that uh, use some examples of good and bad rock paper scissors balancing so here's an example uh first we see red has a 90 percent uh win rate over um uh, black decks yeah, black has a 90 percent win rate over mono green decks and green decks have a 90 percent win rate over red decks and then blues off to the side having a 50 percent uh match against everything this is in my opinion an example of bad rock scissors, scissors balancing because everything's so you know coin flippy so, so uh dramatic on one side it's um basically the only deck that you're going to be able to play that has you know, particularly compelling matchups is, is the blue deck um, everything else is going to just feel like you, everything is just matchup dependent and that feels really bad now compare this to uh, this system here where there's a lot more decks that are viable so there's there, there's six as opposed to just four uh 50 percent uh increase and we also see a range of different uh matchup values there are some 65 percent uh matches but those are rare there's a lot of them that are closer to 50 percent or 55 percent as well um so that leads to a much more compelling and rich metagame you could imagine that any of these decks that has any innovation that helps it uh, do a little bit better against one of their bad matchups or one of their good matchups and then, then everything can kind of move uh so this is um 
in my opinion, an example of what a good rock, paper, scissors style meta uh, game would look like. Because you, you should still see that this is following the rock, paper, scissors uh, methodology because of the interactions of something beating something else and losing to the other things. So what does this all imply for Artifact? Uh, I think that what we can say is that we should expect some amount of rock, paper, scissors style balancing. Obviously, it's difficult right now to guess exactly which strategies are going to be you know, better than others under which circumstances. Uh, but you know, for example, we could expect that red decks are generally advantaged against blue decks and blue decks are generally advantaged against green decks, et cetera, et cetera, something like that. Um, but the degree to which it's going to be following a strict rock and scissors uh, setup, it's probably not going to be close to you know 90% or 100%. It'll probably be more in the you know 55 to 65% range in that. So that's something that I think that you should expect. Another thing that um, you should I should mention is that uh, Dr. Garfield in one of his talks uh, described how metagames that are overly open and overly broad having way you know too many different de viable decks are actually kind of bad and that the, a lot of people don't like them as, as much as they, they think that they do and he kind of suggested that between four and eight decks is about the best um, in his uh, in his opinion now um, of the, the the top competitive decks uh, what this you know, means here is that I don't think people should be expecting an infinitely diverse metagame for Artifact. I know a lot of people think that that's what they want, but in reality, maybe this isn't uh, what's the healthiest for the game. Uh, but we'll see how that plays out, and obviously the definition of what makes a competitive deck versus a fringe deck is up for uh, debate, but uh, just a, another comment that uh, I found interesting from some of his content. So, next, let's talk about skill and balance. Um, it's not just about the cards that you're playing a course nine deck it's also about the player that you are uh this clearly matters a lot more um in a lot of cases than just the cards that you have in front of you there's one story that garfield told in one of his talks about a game that he was balancing in which the uh one of the strategies that was available that was for free uh was perceived as being bad but really it just was uh performing bad and low skill levels, but actually perform quite well at high skill levels. And it, it, this uh, led to a bit of a weird um, you know, effect within the community where it was perceived as being a lot worse than it was, especially at the, the lower skill levels. Um, th this is something that I think we can actually pretty clearly uh, imagine how it might apply to Artifact. I wouldn't be surprised if we see decks that are high skill cap decks that are you know, perform pretty bad in uh, low skill metagames and low at the, the the lower uh tiers and then you do a lot better the higher tiers in fact i think that it, it's worth emphasizing this is also something that uh dota does and valve does uh if you look at you know, heroes like uh, wraith king and bounty hunter in dota 2 uh, wraith king is a hero that does um it's very tanky his, his game plan is largely just kind of getting up to people's faces and hitting them a lot um just to, in the head doesn't have a lot of active skills and uh his ultimate ability is just that he gets resurrected when he when he dies and is on a cooldown doesn't need you know strategic activation or you know uh, keen gameplay to you know, get it off properly um so he's a fairly easy player to uh, a fairly easy hero to play and you contrast this with something like um bounty hunter who's uh, all about stealth and setting up these gank attacks and um it has uh, a lot more uh, necessary to work with his team so this is much higher skill cap uh hero and you can see that in the the win rates of these heroes if you look at the different um uh, skill categories that that uh, you can see in the games there's a lot of great data about this uh, on data uh dotabuff.com that uh, you can see so i wouldn't be surprised if we see styles of this balancing in um artifact as well where there are some decks and some cards some heroes that do well uh at different mmrs next let's talk about snowball and catch up mechanics um if you haven't encountered this idea we, we can go through a couple of examples uh using the game monopoly which i'm sure almost everybody here has played uh so the, the first example we'll talk about somebody who gets the three orange properties you know, first she's the first person to assemble a set of three properties so from here they are able to 
buy up a bunch of houses they, they then they go to hotels and they're able to make tons and tons of rent and this causes uh, what would be known as a snowball in the game because it allows them to take their advantage and catalyze this to a much larger and larger advantage so that's a snowballing uh, mechanic in a game now another th uh, mechanic that is uh, in monopoly that a lot of people use is a house rule but um still almost is a, an official rule of the game is that any money that is given to a community chest or chance goes into the center this can build up to, to a pretty uh, big wad of cash over the course of the game and then if somebody lands on free parking they get all this money now this is a really useful uh, catch-up mechanic because what it means is that if you fall behind in the game and there's a big stack of cash sitting in the middle then you say like oh man if i get that then maybe i can get back into the game i can you know buy something sweet and uh and, and get back into this so that's a really uh useful uh tool uh for for the game and creates dynamic gameplay now one of the things that's interesting in this is that in, in the textbook dr garfield spoke about the uh, snowball and the uh, catch-up mechanics, and he actually kind of described it as like this is a bit, a bit of an illusion in, in some respects, because people perceive the advantage climbing over time and growing over time, but in reality, uh, the uh, advance advantage is sort of all accumulated at the beginning. Um, if you take the example once again, where somebody acquires all three of the orange properties, their net worth at the beginning of the game you know, as they uh, acquire more and more rent, does go up you know, slowly as they're getting um, people landing on their properties. But their chance to win, if you actually were to plot that um, over the course of the game, it actually just spikes as soon as they acquire these three properties. And I mean, of course, it would still increasing after this, every time somebody lands on one of their properties. But that specific event of acquiring the third of the set and being the first to acquire a set uh, is really what propels them to move up in in it and it's, it's less of a snowball and more just a spike so what does this um mean for artifact how do, how could this apply to artifact well i i wouldn't be surprised if we see some amount of snowball-y mechanics in the game in, in some respects you can almost imagine the current you know, knowledge that we have about the the lane setup and that it, it could have a bit of a a, a snowball-y um, appearance since somebody who dominates a lane gets more gold which is able to feed that into their heroes getting better through uh weapons and and, and definitely builds a snowball feel to the game um alternatively you could imagine some catch-up mechanics such as using powerful spells another possibility is actually using the shop which obviously has some uh, randomness to it but we could even uh, imagine things like like what if the prices on the super special uh, items if from the store are somewhat randomized so that you have a chance of picking up something really sweet at a discount price which allows you to get back in the game when you were struggling earlier wait a minute neon once again you know why are you advocating for this bad gameplay in, in our games? Like, isn't randomness and luck bad in games? Like, don't we want to avoid having randomness and luck in games? Uh, this idea of uh, secret sh shop stuff is uh, clearly terrible. Well, I have uh, some things to say to you that you're going to have to get used to because maybe luck isn't all that bad. And I think that uh, Dr. Garfield would really disagree with you on that. So let's get to the next topic within Dr. Garfield's thinking. Luck and skill in games. Um, there, there's a bit of an oversimplification that you'll see within people who uh, talk about card games or games in general that um, games of skill um, are good and games of luck are bad. And we, we of course, chess, a classic game of skill, snakes and ladders, classic game of luck, and that this is the the way things are distilled down that there are good games and there are bad games, and um, and there some of them are luck based and some of them are skill based. So we always want more skill and less luck in our game. This is a bit of a false dichotomy. Um, as you can see, that especially in games like Texas uh, Hold'em Poker. Poker is a game that is very high skill and very high luck in its own uh, way. So where does that fit into things? Dr. Garfield uh, feels that games actually more fall under a two-axis continuum, where there are games that are high variance and low variance, games that are high skill and low skill. You can see 
uh, here sort of different quadrants of different games that uh, fall under the different sides, tic-tac-toes, low skill, low variance. You have um, uh, snakes and ladders, which is low skill, high variance. Poker is a high variance, high skill. And chess is, of course, low variance, high skill. Uh, artifact and I think all trading card games in general sort of fall into the region of medium variance and high skill. I think if I, if I had to describe sort of where they aim, so that might be where we might see uh, the game line up in this diagram. So we know that we can have luck in our games and that this is something that you're all sort of allowed to have in them, but what does it actually do? Like, what, is it, uh, what does it offer to the games? What does it improve? Actually, a, a lot of things, if you ask yeah, Dr. Garfield once again. So, um, so here's some examples. Uh, one, it increases variety. So you, if you, there are random things happen in your game, you're not seeing the same thing happening. Every game, things play out differently. That uh, allows um, every game to feel different and inc increases replayability. Uh, next, it protects ego. Uh, losing sucks, everybody knows this, and when you lose at games that are low variance, it can really hurt, because you're just like, yeah, man, I, I suck, I'm, I'm dumb, it makes me feel stupid. If you have some amount of randomness in the game, it actually feels a lot better to blame RNG this than it does to blame your own play, and so that's a useful thing to have there. Now, that might be a bit of a barrier for you to get better, but it, it feels better to play the game. Another is that it broadens the audience. Um, it, it, uh, w one of the factors that you see in gaming is that you need to be playing against people who have a relatively similar skill level to you um, in order to actually enjoy the games, because if they're a lot better than you, then they stomp you, and if they're a lot worse than you, then you stomp them. And that, uh, although I enjoy stomping people as much as the next person, it does get boring after a certain period of time. So by introducing some amount of variance into the game, it actually increases the range of people that you can play against because somebody who's you know better than you, but not a lot better than you, you can still beat them because the, you can just run hot and then and the game will be competitive and vice versa as well if you if you run badly against somebody who's worse than you. Another thing that it offers is a catch-up mechanic, as we sort of mentioned earlier in the, the shop example. This is a way to offer a catch-up mechanic in the game. Also, the the Monopoly example clearly is also another uh, usage of RNG to add catch-up to the game. There's also a whole certain skill to, to do with randomness, people who are better or worse than playing around random effects and thinking about what are the possible outcomes of a given random effect. So that's something that um, people will sometimes understate that, uh, that just playing around randomness uh, is a skill in and of itself. So how does this... Um, play out for, for artifact, of course. Well, we, we already know that there's some amount of randomness in the game. We know that the creeps spawning in random lanes and attacking in, in different orders uh, or different targets is, is one element of randomness. The shop is another element of randomness as well. So we should expect to see um, all sorts of random uh, effects like this, but sort of lower level ones um, that, are, that are happening within the game to help it keep it uh, uh, fresh and different and establish this. One of the things that I um, found sort of frustrating going through this was uh, I didn't get a clear sense of where Dr. Garfield's thinking was in terms of where RNG should be in a game. Like what, what, what are the correct places for uh, to be randomized? What amount of randomness is good? What amount of randomness is bad? There's a lot of bad examples, obviously, of, of randomness in card games. So Hearthstone has a pretty bad reputation for being too random in a lot of places but like like why is that like what, what would be his um your thinking as to where you put randomness and why so this is something i'm really curious about uh to get thoughts of of his maybe at some point in the future um because this is a um a rich area that uh has a, a lot of complexity and you can imagine being misapplied in various ways there's, of course, a bunch of links below that are on this new suit. There's a specific link about the talk that he gave on a luck versus skill in gaming, because a lot of this came from one specific talk that's, uh, that's in my resources down there. Now, let's talk about economics, our last major section. So the a lot of this stuff came from a collection of different thoughts from his different pieces, but the, the, this is one that uh, section that is really driven from one um, piece that he wrote and published on uh, his Facebook page, Dr. Dr. Garfield's Facebook page, and it's a piece called um, Game Player's Manifesto. And uh, uh, another thing is that I would say is that in general, he takes a pretty um, 
open-ended, open, um, mindset to gaming, and, uh, the, the, there's a lot of different possibilities that you could see in a game to make the game good, but here is a scenario where he has, I think, fairly strong opinions about what makes a game good and versus bad. So I'll, I'll just sort of summarize the points in this, but I would encourage you to just read the whole thing, because it's quite good, and once again, the links are down below. So the, the first is that he says is that there are some games that you can describe as Skinnerware, which are uh, games that are designed to addict players and, and encourage them to constantly um, spend their time and energy and money uh, to constantly advance in the game. Second, he says, no, not, not everybody is particularly addictive and susceptible to these uh, these Skinnerware style games and Skinnerware style effects, but there are some people who are incredibly uh, susceptible to them, and that's something that you need to be aware of. And these um, people who have addictive personalities are an important subset of the gaming um, community. Next, he talks a little bit about whales and what it means to be a whale. Now, I think that a lot of people are used to this um, idea if you've been involved in um, online gaming for a while. Uh, whales are described as people who spend a lot of money on the game and uh, really buy you know, all the possible you know, power-ups and options that are available to you and, and sort of supercharge their game with the power of the wallet. Now, um, one of the things that is a pretty common misconception about whales is that most people who are in that category are just extravagantly wealthy and just are throwing their wallet at the game because they can. It's actually not the case, unfortunately. There are a lot of people who um, are really you know they have fixed incomes they don't have a lot of money to, to spare and they've just been hooked so badly by the game they're just kind of pouring their limited resources into the game and it, it ends up to a pretty unhealthy state because they're kind of ruining their lives when they when they're spending money on the game um so while making money is wrong uh, is not wrong in games like you're, you're allowed to make a profit off of your art and off of your work whale hunting specifically is wrong so designing your game to try to hook um these whales is um isn't healthy because yet you're you're doing something morally um wrong but not only is it wrong morally you're actually just making bad games um there are a lot of examples of games you can find in places like the app store that you have power-ups randomly that you can just purchase that allows you to supercharge even in um multiplayer formats and uh that doesn't particularly you know lead to good compelling gameplay it actually just leads to un imbalanced gameplay so, and one of the things that dr garfield specifically says that is a good um means to uh stop this behavior or limit this behavior is to implement spending caps and having some limits to what you can spend in a game um uh, in in order to uh the things don't get out of control one of the things that Dr. Garfield didn't clarify in as much detail is describing sort of where the term Skinnerware comes from. Um, so you see here a picture of uh, B.F. Skinner, who is a psychologist from the mid-20th century. Uh, he was really famous for following up on some of the work of Pavlov, focusing on training animals. And a lot of the, the lessons that he learned actually showed that they could be applied to humans and training humans how to do things. And it was... Um, pretty powerful research in the, the field of psychology, but a lot of this research has been used in both the field of uh, gaming and the field of gambling to figure out better ways to encourage people to play more than they should and do things more than they should. It's a, it's a um, pretty powerful research and can be misapplied um, fairly often. So uh, once again, there are a bunch of links below that sort of describe some of this stuff in more detail. You can see the link to the manifesto um as well as a couple of additional resources down there um but w what does this relate to artifact once again like how, how can we expect this this we don't have very many details about the economics of the game um could should we expect uh artifact to be a skinnerware style game well obviously not if if uh dr garfield's working on it in fact you know one of the the particular suggestions that he gives is that the, the uh, spending on games should be capped and you'll see this in practically any card game is because you can only buy so much material There's only so much stuff that you can that you can acquire in the game it's not like you you have endless you know places to spend money the one area that you could potentially see in the game that we're lined up to this is depending on the structure of tournaments and how they organize them in the game um and if you look at uh, magic the gathering online there uh is 
uh, some amount of Skinnerware-isms in in their tournament um, structures that they use. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that, but not, but not particularly, given the fact that uh, Dr. Garfield is, of course, pretty conscious of this and wants to avoid these unhealthy and immoral uses of gaming. So with that... Uh, let's do a few conclusions on our way out the door. Uh, the wonderful Richard Garfield has some very compelling thoughts, in my opinion, on the subject of gaming. Very interesting to, to, to learn about that. And um, hopefully you picked up some great lessons from this as to well, where the game might be going, give you some ideas of how to think about uh, the things that are coming in the pipeline and what we um, might be expecting but uh, thank you so much for sticking around and watching. And of course, uh, be sure to like, share, subscribe. This is actually my first video that I've ever done, so I really would love to have the uh, the support in that respect. Of course, give feedback and thoughts on the Reddit thread. You can once again find the link for that below. And then check out Artifact Academy, the website that is associated with it, and where you can find the full article that has all of the details in this. But um, uh, check out everything. Thank you so much for sticking with me, and uh, hopefully I'll be having another video up for you soon.